Welcome to This Commerce Life. We are an unscripted podcast dedicated to small businesses and entrepreneurs in the retail and consumer packaged goods space in Canada and the United States. I'm Phil Chang, co-host and co-founder. And I'm Kenny Benucci, co-host and co-founder of This Commerce Life. Our love is the journey to retail. And our passion is sharing that with you every week. Hey, how's it going? Good, man. Hey, How David, you how are you? Very, very good. Yeah, awesome. nice to meet you. Nice to great meet you. To, yeah, great to meet uh, you. I'm, I'm Phil, and, and that's Kenny. Yeah. I'm liking Kenny's backdrop. That's very oh, cool. Yeah. Green Goblin action there. That's good. Oh, very nice. Very you know, nice. And then you got the boys from Italy, except for the one Cuban and Scarface. Yep. yep. This you know, it's all good in the hood. Yeah, this is what happened to me. I, I have a like a bit of a man cave thing going on and, and every mm-hmm. square inch has pictures. <laughs> you start running out. Like I want to buy this picture, but I got nowhere to put it. There's no it. room, man. You gotta take yeah. all this shit down, right? Run out of space. <laughs> yeah, no. You start thinking about hanging things in the middle of the room. <laughs> well, that's yeah, you start thinking, okay, how do I display this? Maybe I could do a walk around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. See how well how much the wife likes that idea. Yep, absolutely. Right? Yeah, not gonna oh work. My God. Yeah. Oh my God. Fun oh stuff. man, All it good, is. Man. Uh, we're we're glad that you could join us. We uh, you're we're uh, we're glad that you could join us. And I I think um, you're slightly. We'll be up front. You're a slightly unusual guest for for us. We normally have kind of retailers and brands on, um, and then we get we get a lot of um, and then we do get like success stories or um, you know folks from the CPD CPG industry. So. Um, you kind of being in the industry, but adjacent in a service provider is a little bit unusual for us. But, um, but I think your your kind of profile was so interesting to us that um, we really couldn't say no. So, um, so we're interested to to kind of chat with you. Um, we're just so you know, like we're we're an unscripted podcast. I I think um, we kind of relayed some of that stuff, but uh, we we what we're really interested in is, is, um, you know, kind of where you've come from and, and the success that you've seen. And then we'll definitely get into Caro as well. Cause I think you're doing, uh, I saw your video and, and some of your brand partnership stuff. So I think there's some really cool stuff you're doing there that, um, maybe some of the, uh, particularly the emerging brands that we're working with or that listen to us will be interested in. So, um, that's probably okay. So for the oh, listeners, can, yeah, we can just have fun with it. I mean, yeah. I think that's just it. We can yeah. riff, and, and yeah, I come from the game industry, so I'm, I'm coming into e-commerce from a very bizarre vector, and I think we can. Yeah, have fun. yeah, no, no, I I think that's uh, what caught our eye in the first place. Right? Was mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, like we we do we often get folks who kind of like come at this from different angles and. Some of those are the most interesting stories, right? So, so with that, listeners, we, we've got David Perry, who's the CEO and co-founder of uh, the e-commerce network Caro, on with us. Um, you, you've now heard the preface that um, you know of what we were thinking. So, um, David, we'll, we'll kind of turn it over to you. So, if you want to tell us a little bit more about you, and then and then uh, and then we'll go from there and 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 see where this thing takes us. Firstly, I'm probably the tallest guest that you've ever had. You just can't tell in Zoom, can okay. you? <laughs> I'm trying. I can't see anything. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm six foot eight uh, inches oh, tall. Oh, wow. And, okay. um, and most uh, most kids think that I wasted my entire life because I didn't get into basketball. I say basketball? <laughs> but, but, but I grew up in Northern Ireland, and basketball okay. was actually a very mm. – violent sport because you played it with with a whole team of rugby players and oh, excellent. Uh, there was, honestly they didn't even really understand the rules of basketball it was sort of rugby with a basketball and um and that was that was pretty tough but it was uh in i grew up in in northern ireland in belfast and um and i it was freezing cold outside the sort of running joke in ireland is it only rained twice this week once for three days and once for four days and so <laughs> That's why uh, suddenly I, I got into video games because that's something you can do indoors. Yeah. And um, I didn't realize that you could actually get paid to make video games. Like wh- how insane is that? And so one day I got a check in the mail as a kid. I was probably about 15. And I, I just was like, wait, what? This it was about. I'm getting paid. 
that was, was six, fun to do. Paid to now play. I'm getting paid. Yeah, yeah. it's like six hundred dollars, yeah. I think. And I was like, yeah. do you know how much candy that's gonna buy? And so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> exactly, like, man. And all, what did you do? You played. I went and bought candy. Come and then on. I was, then I started typing all night long. Um, so when I realized the potential, but it turns out that the video game industry in in Northern Ireland wasn't really very big. It was close to non-existent. So I ended up moving to England because I thought that's where all the action was. And I, mm -hmm. I, I started to work on games there. But what I realized, um, which thankfully happened really early, was I realized the power of brands. So if I make a video game and I call it Jumpy Boy, it's very hard to get the world to play Jumpy Boy. Um, but if I, one of the first games I got to, to make was the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And no suddenly, a number one, yeah suddenly I have a number one hit. And, uh, and when you have a hit game, then everyone wants to work with you. Like everything's on the table. Uh, and so every time I made a game for myself, it was kind of like really hard to, to get. Wait, wait, so sorry. Cause, um, the art, like, are you talking about the arcade version? So the one that you throw a quarter in, I play oh, that yeah. game a lot. Like I love, I love that game. No. So, so in England, um, yeah. it's kind of, Kind of in England, the video game industry was different from America. Okay. Um, in America, when I say different, it's it was to be clear, every machine in England had a keyboard on it. Yeah. Um, so it meant that a lot of people were becoming coders because the way you would actually buy a video game is you would buy a magazine and type it in. Which uh, was yeah, great. I remember that. Typing skills. We had the best typing yeah. skills because yeah. you're typing all these games. You would save them to a cassette tape yep. and, uh, and store them. And so that was that was the industry at, at the time. Whereas other people, um, you know, in America, there was a lot of Ataris and things like that where you right. had joysticks. sticks. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. It meant that, yes, they were playing games, but they weren't yeah. getting the access. But it wasn't totally true because you still had Commodore 64s and things like that in the U.S. So, so it, I had a Commodore 64 and yeah. I was a bad coder because I did the same thing and I followed the code but I would always offset something. So if you played like a sniper game, my buildings would always be off by like two blocks. Do yeah. You know? Like it just, you, you knew that I, I was never going to do this for a living because all of my buildings were staggered. Uh, well, just... It, 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 I, just, I, I found out recently, I didn't actually know this, but, but Elon Musk started out. That was yeah. his very first thing he ever did was make games. So I went yeah. and found the game online and played it. And so that's interesting to see, you know, um, how basic things were back then, you know? Yeah. So um, honestly, a lot of games didn't work, even if they, even if you thought they were working. What I cared about was it would say lives equals three. And I'm like, hmm, if I put lives equals 10, do I get 10 mm -hmm. lives? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, yes, you do. And so, you, you know, you start hacking games and learning how they work that way. So um, that's awesome. So how yeah. long ago was this? Like how, how, how far back this, are we going? This was back when I was in my, um, I, I, I actually, well, just to, to sort of finish the thought, I ended up leaving high school. Yeah. I was about 17 at the time. Right. Okay. And but you're so, in London at this point or not yet. I, I literally was in, in high school and just left and went to England. And my teachers oh, wow. were like, what okay. are you going to do? Wow. Did you, what the video hell? games. That's a terrible idea. Because <laughs> like, at the time, it felt like video games had no, they weren't really a career, right? That wasn't, I mean, everywhere I went, when I said, oh, I make video games, they're like, I've never met someone that makes video yeah. games. That was a new thing at the time. Yeah. So, um, but in, in England, um, it went well. Um, you know, I got to make some really cool games. But probably one of the most interesting was um, when the Sega Genesis came out. Right. I got one, and they asked me to do the Terminator for for James Cameron on it, and uh, and that was just such high pressure. And it it showed how bad licensing was um, at, at that time. So, you know, can you imagine how exciting that is? You're going to get to make the Terminator. The Terminator. Game. And then they, and we're like, we're going to be the Terminator. Like every gamer wants to be the Terminator. And then they're like, well, you can't be the Terminator. We don't have the rights to do that. You, you have to be um, one of the other people from the movie. And so, because I guess they didn't have the rights with Arnold to, to be the Terminator. So we're like, it's okay. It's okay. We'll be Sarah Connor because at least she's still a hero. Yeah. And they're like, well, we don't have Linda Hamilton. No, have have yeah, that that what can I be? <laughs> Think you're, like, dog. you're like you're like the uh you're like the red jersey star trek guy right like the, at the beginning <laughs> no, they i don't want to be the red jersey guy. guy he always dies like <laughs> so, so they said to us you can beat kyle reese and we're like but he dies in the movie <laughs> exactly <laughs> what the hell good is that spoiler for your listeners just... <laughs> yeah <laughs> for those that, that that haven't seen terminator yet but anyway that was 
it was a nightmare. Uh, and so what I love is how uh, through my career, I used to go to Hollywood meetings and you would be in the room with these executives who could care less about the game industry. And so the chances of you ever getting a good deal were really low, um, you know, where they would actually care and, and do the right licensing. Right. But as time went on, that totally changed. So as those people all, you know, expired, um, we got young people moving into, into management positions. Every single sports person these days grew these days grew up um, with video games. Yes. Every every single uh, like just so many decision makers in the world, you know, are sure. all grew up with games, and they're welcome. We're so welcome everywhere now compared to to those days. But um, but I thought that was a really a, a real That's classic. So years later, many years later. So in the end, I ended up moving to America. This is going to take the whole podcast. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I love this. No, no, I love the story. But, yeah, but I ended up moving to America. Um, why did I move to America? The Virgin called me up and said, um, we're making, we're, we need to get a game done really quick for McDonald's. Would you be willing to get it done? Uh, and I said, sure. And, and so they said like, lock your front door, get in an airplane, come to California. We'll take care of everything. Just get this game done. So we make this McDonald's game. And then the McDonald's executives show up to take a look at it. And they absolutely hate our game. Um, oh, no. it's because, we, we didn't put Ronald McDonald in the game and we, we don't like Ronald McDonald. Um, so they insisted that he was put in the game. So we sort of snuck him in at the end of a level, he'd be waving a flag or something. But the game, we launched the game and the game ended up winning game of the year. And game of the year for a license game was, if you think about it, I'm only there just to get this thing done. But now um, Sega and Virgin are like, please stay, we wanna keep going. Yeah. So. This ended up with me just going, I'm not going to go back to England. To hell with England. <laughs> I'm going to stay in America. I ended up becoming American. I, I pledged my allegiance to the flag. Wow. Um, but but what happened then was, um, I, you know, I, I did a bunch of other stuff. But the, the one that was most interesting, I think, was getting to make the Matrix um, video games. And the the Wachowski brothers at the time, now, now uh, <laughs> Lana and um, Forgotten, um, well, um, Lily, there you go. Lana and Lily are the, the Wachowskis now. Um, but at the time they had reached out um, and um, they, you know, the, the talent from, from the Matrix was just ridiculous. Like the quality of that first movie. I don't, I'm assuming you guys were fans. Um, Huge. I, I'm the idiot that turned it down. So they, they offered me the rights to the Matrix and I said, no, I'm a bit Jeez. busy right now. Think about this. Think I'm of this just, still coming now, new stuff. I, oh my I'm God. Sit, I'm sitting in the audience with my wife and, she, and she's like, you turned this down. <laughs> this is unbelievable. And I'm like, I know I'm dying. So, so then they, they contacted me afterwards and they said, um, um, you know, would you like to work on the uh, the the second movie? And um, and this this was obviously peak Matrix, so it's when the excitement could not be um, sort of bigger. And we ended up making a game with them, but it was so fun to see the difference because they actually shot an hour of movie footage just for our game. And the cost of Matrix movie footage is insane. So that, like, you know, the game industry generally can't afford to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so to get to work with that, with talent like that, um, it, it's life changing, you know, That's like it's, awesome. really, it's really life changing. Um, and, um, and one other one I got along the way, just, just to throw it out there for any, any video game fans is um, I programmed the Aladdin video game on the Sega Genesis. And that was the first time Disney let their animators actually work with the game developers and it was so unfair like if you're an animator in the game industry we have we have disney <laughs> like we have actually got disney doing our animation it's such an unfair fight and so when that game came out the animation was ridiculous like it, it sort of it pushed us forward i think because it, it sort of it, it meant you had to take animation way more seriously right. um mm -hmm. because it's so fluid but um but yeah, so so much fun. And so my last thing I did in the game industry was I, I was working on the idea of cloud gaming, which is the future yep. of gaming. It's not, it was, it was thinking like, well, we stream all our music, we stream our movies, we're technically we're streaming our books now. Yeah. Um, why would you, why do video games, are they, are we going to buy the same console, you know, as millions of other people over and over and over and over forever? Or is that going to change at some point? And Video games, if you think about it, are always 
they have to be dumbed down because they have to be put onto a console that a lot of people can buy. Yeah. But wouldn't you prefer to play it on a, on a console I can't afford? And that's actually why the arcades existed in the old days when 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 you would have a, a game that cost ten thousand yeah. dollars. I want to experience that, but I don't want to spend ten thousand dollars. Dragon right. Slayer. Right. Yeah. Right. Dragon, Dragon Slayer. Slayer. Like this this idea of like a cartoon, two D, but in action and fluid. You you could never. You, you couldn't do that on a Commodore 64. You couldn't do it on a, uh, you know, one of the square box IBM monochrome or <laughs> you couldn't, what? you just you couldn't. couldn't. Yeah. There's no way. Um, yeah. And so this was this idea of, if you're thinking into the future of gaming, um, to be able to have an incredible compute in the cloud and then deliver that to any device um, is a kind of a, I think a, a really exciting future for the game industry. And so Sony bought our company and then built it into the PlayStation. It's called PlayStation Now. And today they're, they're, they're streaming all of the different um, PlayStation games, but they haven't yet built that, that next generation right. game that runs in the cloud. I'm just waiting for that. I think, that's a, I think that changes everything when they make that game um, because it's going to be very hard to go back to a, a $500 game when you just paid a $5,000 game. I, I think that's... That's going to change things. I, I wow. agree with you. I think I think you look at even what something like a Fortnite has done, which is not a cloud game, right? Like it's still very yeah. software based. There are cloud portions of it, but it's already changed. You know the way we game. It's actually changed the landscape of PCs, for example, right? Like now, gaming laptops is a thing. Like all of these things, right? So. When we actually get to cloud gaming, it's it's going to be huge. It's it's going to kind of like turn everything yeah, on its, its side. Someday so. thing. We don't know quite when, but uh, yeah. if I was still in the game industry, I'd be working on that first game. I'd be yeah. going hardcore to try to make that game. Yeah. But um, so then I I ended up um, building a man cave with everything that I've ever wanted to do in it. So metal work, woodwork, 3D printing, photography studio, everything you could possibly want. And in that, I found photography became the most interesting. I find photography to be the best gift you can give to somebody. So if someone, everyone needs pictures of themselves, but when you take pictures of people that they actually like, yeah. it becomes their social profile and they start, you know, really using it and they love that. So it turns out to me, that was of the, of the room. That's the most fun piece of the room. But then I found that if I took pictures of influencers, um, then I would get lots more attention. So, you know, it's nice to take a picture of your friend, Bob, but when you when you actually have an influencer with 15 million followers, you get a whole different response. And so that became kind of fascinating to me. And I found myself talking to them about what's it like to be, um, you know, in that space. And I I mean, you just keep hearing the same story. It's it's not as it's not as good as it sounds uh, because I, I never get to work with people I really want to work with the, the brands I really want to work with. Um, you know, I'm always trying being asked to sell things I don't really want to sell. I can't compromise to my audience. And so my, you can imagine me, I'm like, oh, this, we got to be able to solve this. What do I know, right? I'm not from e-commerce. I'm not from, you know, social media. Um, I'm from the game industry, but I'm looking at going, this is a solvable problem. Um, and, and, and it just, it, the problem was I keep getting bashed on the head with this. So I would be having dinner. And it would be a, one of my daughter's friends is making 30,000 a month as a, as a 12 year old. And, uh, and I'm like, you know, she's, she would show us video of, she went to a hotel um, and, and the room had been filled with makeup by some agency and, um, and, and you, she doesn't even wear makeup. So they just film it and then throw it all in the trash. And, and then she had this backpack, which, you know, one of the girls said, I love your backpack. And she's like, I love this backpack. I wear this backpack every day. It's my favorite. And I'm thinking to myself, I'd rather be the backpack company Absolutely. than the makeup company that's now in the trash can. Yeah. And so I'm like, is there a way to solve that with data? Like, is there some way we could, we could work this out? And so that's in the end, I'm like, damn, I'm going to do it. And, and I, I'd met this entrepreneur who was working on how to get brands and influencers to work together. And, and so I ended up uh, um, joining forces with him, and we ended up building this company. But I'm very, um, I'm very interested in, in 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 that space, and that just evolved and evolved and evolved. Um, we we started to get, um, we we sort of realized that influencers. It seems obvious to go to the influencers first, but what you actually find is the brands are the are the the core. They're like the 
they're like the honey pot um, yeah. that it puts the the influencers in. So yeah. if you can get the support of brands, then it's easier to work with the influencers. So we built a technology to help brands work with influencers, and um, and uh, we also sort of realize that brands need to work with brands. And that sounds crazy, but if you think about the number one problem that brands have, I just went to a marketing conference and everyone was talking about iOS 14 and how Apple changed the privacy rules and it's yes. really, really hurting. Yeah, um, it's screwing with all our, yeah. So what are you going to do? And, yeah. and everyone talked about, you know, how to squeeze blood from the stone, like how to how to run ads and try to save a little bit of money. Yeah. But none of them were, were like just coming from a different way. And, and our perspective is, but brands have a lot of traffic already. If you look at them as a group, so if yeah. we have over 30,000 brands using our technology now, together they have 350 million visitors a month. So if you have 350 million visitors that are already in this system monthly, right. yeah. um, why, don't you, why don't you partner with somebody and, yeah. and get access to their traffic? So you sell bicycles, I sell helmets. You don't have helmets. Would you like to sell my helmets? Maybe I'll sell your bikes. I don't know, maybe but definitely sell my helmets. Now my helmets are in your traffic and I'm getting your traffic for free. So by getting brands to work together, if you think about it, that you're getting that traffic for free forever, not just like a yeah, click yeah. or something. You get it all day, every day, month after month, as long as you stay friends with that brand. Yep. So you want to you be on best behavior um, and, 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 and work well together. But if you do, then you say, well, how many more of those relationships do you want? Like there's loads. You don't you want to be in the skateboard stores. You want to be on all the bike stores. I mean, there's lots of places for you to go. Um, and we can do that. So we built the technology to sort of make that possible. Um, but we made it really easy. So um, what we realized is, is wholesale, which still exists today, shockingly, um, is you buy, you're, you're buying limited amounts of products. So if, if I say, let's get helmets, well, then the first thought is what colors are going to sell? I don't know. Um, so they got 24 colors. I'm not buying all 24. I'll try these three. Right. And then, well, what sizes you want it in? Uh, uh, maybe, you know, the big size and the medium, like maybe three sizes. Yeah. But ultimately if, if you use technology, we can just take all the helmets and all the colors and all the sizes and, and just wire them straight into your store. Thanks to, to, to the internet. It's all just connected together. So effectively all of their inventory becomes your inventory. And so, um, it allows you to just just fundamentally think about your business differently because now you're going to work out what your audience wants, not what you as a buyer think. I see the worst buying decisions. I, we used to be by a mall and they would have um, like a whole store and some buyer would be like lemons are in and the whole store would be dressed with lemons and everything's lemon print and all the rest of it. It's like, you better, lemons better be in. <laughs> well, we're ex retail buyers, you know that, right? Both of us came from oh, really? retail buying. Really? And it, and what you're saying is that you know, you come in yeah. and show me four things, and I'd be looking at it thinking, oh fuck, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Based yeah. on what I've seen, based on the shows I've gone to, based on what I'm seeing online, yeah, I think this one, this one looked pretty yeah. cool. Let's do this. And then what do you do? You take yeah, a chance and you this. buy them. Let's go. You roll it right? down. And that man. could be your lemons, right? And yeah. then you, you put them in store and you're thinking, well, oh, shit, that didn't do that good. Well, you or gamble, the other you thing gamble is, oh, part man, of I your PL, right? right? Like you, well, you hope this works, or I'm writing off a bunch of stuff, and then I got to hit know. another home run, so I, I don't have to worry about it, right? But and to your point, like yeah. the way you're doing, you know, in the old ways, or I guess it's not even the old ways, the way it's still done still is done. you don't know until you've committed yeah. a shit ton of dollars to inventory. Someone's had to build all this stuff. It's moved around the country fifty thousand yeah. times it's in the store. Now we're waiting for somebody to bump into it, as opposed to hey. You know, this comes in 75 different sizes. None of them are here. Relax. And what do you like? Yeah. What do you, what do you want? There, there's a, there's different a way. whole bunch of things there, right? Like I think even if I go back to brands collaborating with brands, ah. uh, you know, you so know, much the, opportunity. The, the conversation that you just had or the, the scenario you just gave us, you know, Kenny and I uh, brokered a conversation between two brands and um, you know, we're, awfully familiar with one brand and then i knew the guy at another brand that thought we should do some work together but it took us three conversations just to get the two to the table right three because, conversations just to get the you conversation. know because you you yeah. you know you, you come into this like a like two cautious partners and nobody wants to give anything away you know what what we're trying to do is just have a frank conversation but at the end of the day 
what we're really trying to say is, well, no, you, it, that's exactly it is. You sell bicycles and I sell helmets. Why don't we just do that together? How do we do that? But but you got to do this like the old school way is you got to do a dance. You you know you got to take one on the date. You got to. <laughs> Why am I talking you know, to you? Like, Why aren't you talking like somewhere to along me? the way we need to sign an NDA oh so we can God. talk frankly. Like, you know, like it's like six months in the making, right? But and and for like what? On a and nine times out of ten, they don't go anywhere. Yeah, right. but on a platform, it takes all that crap out of it, right? Because Absolutely. you just go. Look, guys, this it's this pure, right? Is I have a product that if I wasn't involved, a retailer would go, You have bikes, he has helmets. I don't give a flying rat's ass what you guys want. <laughs> they go together. So I'm putting right. them together, I'm gonna sell them, right? Like so it's it's uh well, imagine this from a data yeah. perspective. We actually know what what helmets sell. So you're about to add a helmet yep. to your store and we're like, don't add that helmet. Don't do that one. Don't do that one. <laughs> Not a good helmet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Statistically, you know, that one gets you a bigger basket if the yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. We have really good examples of that. And and it's just funny because that that matters too. Like what's yeah. what's hot right now? Like what's hot? And yeah. and we know because we have all that data. And and so I think that's, it changes everything. Like I, 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 I talked to this brand who makes spaghetti and she, this lady had three different, three different colors of spaghetti. Right. And, and I'm like, what, what are your plans like to expand and blow this up? And she's like, well, I'm thinking of adding another color. And, uh, and I'm like, so, so what's the plan then a, a, a checkout, you're going to upsell spaghetti with the spaghetti. <laughs> well, yeah. Where are you going with this one? <laughs> is this the thing? And by the way, your website is is absolutely beautiful, and it has incredible recipes on it. But you you insist that if anyone wants to make anything that you recommend, they have to go to other websites. <laughs> like, like you will not help them with this. You're going to just tease them um, with, and, and you know, they, she has beautiful uh, table lays with, uh, yeah. you know, cutlery and and all the rest oh. of it. That have but, to be bought from somebody from somebody and tie well with what you're selling yeah you're gonna to go to amazon and, and start hunting right. and try to find all these things um and it just doesn't seem to me like the best way to merchandise um it also means the site is always the same like you come back there and it's always the same three right. items that's the store um what what happens is once you start to think of this idea of virtual wholesale um, that means that you can take the helmets and put them in your store, and then you can change your mind. I don't want to sell helmets. No problem. There's no restocking fees. There's no returns. Right. There's not, no, no clearance sale. So, so, so what that changes in your mind is, well, in that case, I can have anything anytime, right? So therefore, it's going to be Valentine's Day. Can I get a whole bunch of stuff for Valentine's Day and liven up my store for Valentine's Day and then just clear it out right afterwards? Yeah. If you can, right? Halloween. Um, Fourth of July, the holidays, whatever you want, you can actually now make your store alive right. by 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 putting relevant yeah. products in. Yeah. So we made a list of all of the 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 things that happen in the year, and it's there's a holiday for everything. Like for every, <laughs> you know, there's bicycle day. There's a day for everything. Yeah. It's bicycle yeah. chain day. <laughs> there's, like, there's but, you're, but you're right. But there are there's think of that yeah. International Coffee Day, International Bike Day. All the religions now, because the world's gotten very small, there's yeah. always somebody's religious ceremony on any given day. There's yeah. always something going on that, again, from because we came from the traditional retail and the stores, I can't react that fast. I can't buy that way. I, no. I don't have time. I, I Six months between holidays isn't enough time sometimes to get rid of the shit that I, that I got stuck with. Like, so, it's not that so easy. We're, we're recording this on April 21st, and today is... Get to know your customers national day. It's national high five day. It's also national chocolate covered cashews day. There you go. National kindergarten day. And then this one's the best one because I don't actually, I don't know what kind of bat we're referring to, but it's national yellow bat day. There you go. There's, there's someone with bats. Um, How do you I buy know. for that? I, I love this stuff, you know, because you know, <laughs> the thing is, if you're if you're sitting there trying to keep your brand fresh, um, why not? Why would why wouldn't you think that way and start to to yeah. try to, to do that stuff? And so, what what we think is, um, which is kind of uh, again a weird perspective, but I'm starting to think that influencers are becoming brands and brands are becoming influencers. And and, um, and what that means is mm -hmm. when a brand builds a store. They're actually becoming curators of the store in the form of a taste 
profile. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, when what we learn about influencers is influencers are, are do a brand deal to sell a bag. But when you look in the comments, they're actually looking at everything in the picture. They're looking yeah. at the sunglasses. They're right. talking to all It's a full lifestyle, right? What, right. Yeah. Even, what restaurant yeah. are they in, right? They're, they're, yeah. There's a conversation going on about everything. And, yeah. and brands are actually the same. They just don't realize it. They just... Um, they think they're selling some shoes and they can't imagine anyone would want anything else that, that you know, but in reality they do. Um, and so this is, this is a kind of a fun changeover. So the thing is that influencers, I think, honestly, I, I think that, that everything's about to change for them because um, with the, the, these new uh, privacy rules and, and the, 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 as, mm -hmm. as advertising becomes more and more expensive, what's mm -hmm. going to happen with influencers is I think they're going to end up becoming the retailers. And um, the reason is, is if you ask an influencer, um, would you like the brand to send the product, sell the product, or would you like to sell the product? Like, would you, do you want to own the customers or would you like them to have all the customers? Mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, every influencer that you see make the move from follower to customer, the, the, the enterprise value goes up exponentially. So if you look at Kim Kardashian, she has skims. And uh, and Skims is valued at, at over three billion dollars now. Um, right. you know, Rihanna with Fenty, Fenty Beauty over three billion dollars, and it's because they've taken their followers and converted them, brought them up. over. Um, right. But not not someone else's customers. Ultimately, right. mm -hmm. they're able to to remarket to those people and keep um, that relationship today. What happens is most influencers just send their clicks to somewhere like Amazon, mm -hmm. and Amazon keeps all the customers, mm -hmm. and they get a few percent. If you're the retailer, you get about ten times. You get paid about ten times as much. So you want to get you want to be the retailer of record and own the customers. It's a game changer. And and so then you say to yourself, well, what percentage of the influencers in the world today? And this is a question to you. What percentage of the influencers today have made that transition and actually own the customers, and 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 are considered the retailer? Um, I got of a hundred percent. What percentage would you say have made the transition? Oh, peanuts. It's got to be small. Maybe peanuts. two percent, three percent. Maybe. I would. I, I would. I would say it's maybe one percent. I say maybe. Um, but maybe. I, but I, I'd not even be one percent. I don't so, think it's that. So what's the opportunity space there? Jesus and you go, well, how big is e-commerce globally? It's five point five trillion this year with a T. So here am I in the game industry thinking it's the biggest thing ever. If you're in the game industry, you feel like you're on a rocket ship. Um, you know, we're, we're a hundred billion. I, I imagine now it's more than a hundred billion. And, um, and then you come to the, the e-commerce space, you're at 5.5 trillion. It's, it's just insane. And so, so the, I think the influencers as they make this transition are going to get a bite of that, um, of that. And it's, and, and so, the thing is, at the end of the day, they're going to need to partner with brands, and I and so I think that partnership that happens with brands is going to be very, very important. And the really, really smart brands are going to be the ones that also white label some of their stuff, so it right. can be influencers. Um, you're going to see, uh, you know, a, a curve on that as people uh, understand the value of that. But what we found is that when you talk to like music artists or or to uh, you know, uh, a lot of influencers, they think they have to have their logo on something for it to be theirs. So, you know, the t-shirt has to have their logo right? or therefore you can't sell it. But then you look at someone like Bono at U2, you know, people want to buy his sunglasses. It's that, a it's, sunglass. I was going to say, those glasses are cool. It doesn't have to say Bono on it. I don't right? care what's <laughs> names. I just want to have those glasses. Yeah. I just think, you know, yeah. they're, they're helping people discover cool things. Right. What I find is in, in photography, um, some of my favorite photographers, like they'd make a comment, this is the best light I've ever used. It's incredible. And then I'd go buy the light and it's the best light I've ever used, right? right. And because they know what they're talking about. And that loop of trust and respect really matters. Um, and so you start to find people, you know, in social media that you, you, you genuinely trust and, 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 uh, and they can't break that. So that's really important that they, um, have real authentic relationships. So for me, this is, you can see probably, maybe it's starting to probably become clear why I find this space fascinating. Yeah, it's, yeah. This is really an interesting. It's pretty cool. Interesting space. It's, and at wow. some point we can do it with the game industry. How many how many influencers are playing video games? If you look at Twitch and, and you know, that whole space, it's it's. Well, you look at you look at even the early YouTubers, the like the Dan TDMs of the world and folks like that, that 
play Minecraft, right? Like my, my kids are, uh, my oldest is 20 now. So he grew up, you know, a hundred percent on Minecraft. Right. And so watching those guys play, they're huge influencers, right? Like everything that Dan TDM had. So everything you said is exactly, you know, my kid would show up and go, listen, I only saw for a quick second, but I know exactly what keyboard and what keys Dan TDM was using in his video. Could we yeah. please go and get that keyboard? Could we get, you know, and then he has these modules for Minecraft. So could I please, right? Like all these sort of things, right? It's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just how it is. If you're, yeah. if you're a, if there's someone that you really, really admire and you want to be like them, you want to play like yeah. them, and they have a certain keyboard or a certain chair, that's the most appealing keyboard and chair to you. Yeah, it might, yeah. You know, yeah. you can argue it's a bad idea or whatever, but not to them. It's not relevant, like, man. It's not a bad I idea. I, I want that chair. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's, so, it's, it's no different than having, you know, that glove, right? Like in the old days, uh, the shortstop who had the great glove, right? Tony Fernandez here in Toronto or whatever, whatever, you know, era you're from, it's it's you know sports did it like why why can't everybody else do it right everybody why would why do people stop thing? wearing ccm and went to jofa yeah. helmets for yeah. hockey because yeah. Gretzky wore a jofa helmet right? yeah, yeah yeah and you think yeah. well ugliest thing nobody wanted him before yeah. that he put it on thinking oh my god well obviously you can't play hockey without that <laughs> helmet because look at him so <laughs> if you want to be like him you got to get that yeah, helmet. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I got that i got no choice yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, i uh i love watching all of this evolve and um that's so crazy yeah. how fast things are going to change though and where it's all gone that way yeah wow can, can we go can we go back a second so because right about now you you've you've gotten us all wound up on this and we're i'm sure that we have a lot of uh brands who are going to be all wound up on this so maybe walk us through this part so i'm a brand uh like what's typical for us right we we would have brands that uh, I, you know, we have them all shapes and sizes that listen to us, that follow us, that have talked to us. But the ones that I guess the prototypical would be someone who said, I, I built a product, um, you know, and in the last, you know, kind of couple of years, I've now built myself a bricks and mortar and an e-com business. You know, I've gone from like bricks and mortar, I've gone from zero to, you know, kind of eight, nine, a thousand stores. I've got distribution. My e-com business is now growing like crazy. More than likely, they built themselves on Shopify. Um, that's probably the kind of predominant platform. What is like how how does a brand like that um, start working with someone like you? Like, so how do I? Do you know what I mean? Like, maybe walk us through the, some uh, of that because I think that would help. I think you know, so. What's the trigger? Like, when when do they to, even like, know? Like, really... like, why am I talking yeah. to? You? Like, why yeah. why do I listen to podcasts and get excited? And what am I supposed to do now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have, we have a problem. It's a bit like a dating site. Honestly, if you, if you think about brands, <laughs> um, they're all interested uh, at, in different ways of who they're willing to date. Yeah. Um, and the bigger the brands, the more selective they become right. about who they're willing to date. And yeah. so we had to build all of that into our system mm -hmm. um, where we help um, in a way velvet rope, the really big brands <laughs> so they can work each with, with each other easily. Um, they want to know, like, are we vouching for this brand? Is this really a legit um, company um, that mm -hmm. we should be looking at? Yes, this one is. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the process is when you onboard, if you're a little tiny brand, like imagine your brand hasn't sold anything yet. You're, you're just, it's aspirational. I'm going to sell mm -hmm. something someday. Those brands, instead of, um, instead of saying, hey, you should go try and do deals within the network, we say to them, you should be working on growing. And we built a whole technology, which we call Influencer Checkout, where you can start to invite influencers to uh, to shop for free. And um, and they come in and they buy your products and you just have to click approve. So they make requests, you click approve and, the pro and we generate the order. So you have no work to do. You only click approve um, and the influencer gets the products. So grow, grow, grow. And once you grow, then, you know, start uh, trying to partner up with people. But so people generally want to partner with other people with real sales and real, um, mm -hmm. you know, real traffic. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. In, right. in your analogy, you know, that 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 example brand is already killing it. So to, to some extent, they're going to come in and say, OK, I, there's two possible ways to work with this. There's, there's the first is I'd like to think about um, getting 
other stores that I respect to sell my products. Mm -hmm. And so we just wire them together. So if, if the brands are already on our network, it's actually, you know, it's instant. You can just say yes, yes. And they start working together. Um, if it's, um, a brand that's not on our network, but they're on Shopify, there's 2 million brands on Shopify. If there's one out there that you really love, um, you know, just tell us and, and we can have them install. And the two of you work together, um, like immediately the minute they install, you, you can start doing business together. And so, um, the, the, the opportunity space, as far as the 2 million brands that are out there is great. What we love is those connections the most. So uh, yes, I can market and get somebody, but if I can get two brands that love each other, mm -hmm. um, cool sometimes, sometimes we've had as much as 10 to one. So one brand brings in 10 others where all the CEOs are friends and they want to, to, to collaborate. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I could give you examples of, of why that is, but yeah. I think, um, so, so that's generally, they, they very commonly know who they want to work with or else, um, we'll help them do that. And we have all kinds of really cool tech. Like one of the, one of the tech that we use is we look at the influencers from each of the brands. So, mm -hmm. so this one is joined. We look at their influencers versus the influencers on other brands. And we actually do an aesthetic match through influencer taste. Um, oh, so, really? cause how would you ever, like it's too, when you have too many yeah. brands, a million brands how do you know that yeah you don't you know this one and that one should, yeah. should talk right so we do it through this fingerprint that we've created with the influencers so we can see because they're they're the best taste <laughs> sort of filter um you are, and, you and are if there's tinder a pattern for more, uh <laughs> yeah well, you're, you're like you're like tinder for brands and, and influencers. It, it, is. it is like literally there's ai running in the background trying to help you work out who you should you should meet but what happens is the um the brand will say I have never heard of these people, but they're really cool. And it's like, well, of course they are. They're just like you. They're just like you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny, That's funny. Thing, so, so back to, 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 to your example, they could come in and they can say, look, I'd like other people to sell my products. And that makes them a supplier. So they become the supplier and they're able to sell um, with anyone else that's willing to stock their products, that's how you get a lot of traffic for free. And that, you know, that's obviously very cool because that reduces your acquisition cost profoundly. Um, but the the next thing is, um, well, what if you're, if, if you think about it, what if you're actually, um, uh, in this case, I'm, I'm pushing my products into other people's traffic, but what if I need products for my store or I'm thinking of expanding and becoming more of a marketplace? Right. Um, well, then you just look through our catalog and you choose brands that you'd like to work with. And we have some AI for that as well. If you show us a product, we can scan the database for something like that, um, you know, with visual recognition. Mm -hmm. And so then that will help you find um, um, specific products you're really, really searching for. But ultimately that allows you to add and augment to your store. So let's say you sell makeup, do you sell brushes? Um, they'll be like, well, we're not making our own brushes. We're not really in the brush business. We're in the makeup business. Yeah, you should be selling brushes too. Um, trust me, and we'll find a partner that you really like, and you can sell their brushes and and, and have that immediately. So you can see how that starts to come together. We've added a, an, another yeah. tech re recently, which is bundles. So you can sell the whole bundle, um, mm -hmm. so the entire outfit, in, in one, as one SKU as well. Mm -hmm. how, how do you work out? So, um, so I get that part now. So I get I get the matching bits. I get the uh matchmaking has always been very difficult right like finding um and then creating the conversation between brands and other brands uh creating conversations with retailers is ridiculously difficult because retailers want opportunity but don't really actually want to talk to anybody about the opportunity <laughs> they just want it there uh, but how do you do you do you also help them work out trading terms or that's kind of up to the two brands to figure out yeah, that's the, they okay. literally okay. agree on that per deal. Okay. So yeah. whatever their deal is. And retailers actually are kind of funny because we did talk to a very major retailer um, that I thought was kind of funny because they said to us, could you help us decide what to buy because you have all this data? And so we, we literally built this whole interface so that they could, you know, go in and, and try to work out what they what they should buy based mm -hmm. upon business intelligence. Yeah. And they're like, no, 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 we don't want any interface. Just tell us what to buy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Retailer, look, so anyone that gets breed. into things that with retailers, um, Kenny would have even more experience with this than I would, but like retailers are experts at one, not being found. They don't want to be contacted. And yet 
they want what they want and they want it somehow delivered even though they don't want to talk to anybody to get it right like retailers are in famous for going to shows and like swapping out badges when they were going in real life so that nobody knew that they were so buyer you and you found. kind of go yeah. how does one talk to you and tell you about the brand if you don't want to be found like i don't <laughs> yeah. but it's it's such a they're they're funny animals that way i yeah, think I, I think the industry is changing now but back then yeah it was, I think it's going to be a data-driven business yeah. and it's going to make them deadly when they yeah. use that once they once yeah. they use data they're going to not you're going to find it hard to go back at the time when we were having those meetings we pulled the data to see what the top selling item across all 30,000 brands was mm -hmm. and that week it was leg makeup and we all looked at each other and went what's leg what's makeup? leg makeup, leg makeup. <laughs> and, and, and it, it's funny because obviously some influencer somewhere must have been talking about it and yeah. causing us about it but um it, it was we were finding it was a very high um from discovering what it is i think what happened is people were like we got to try this like you know uh, uh the the customers i think were when they first heard about it were like well i got to try that i've never even heard of that before like what does that do to your legs um and so i don't know it's i think data is gonna is gonna really surface some interesting but how uh, does that how does a retailer work so you gotta go back like because how does a traditional retailer work around that? Because leg makeup's hot this week, right? Like you said, I have no freaking idea what leg makeup is. I was a buyer. I sit there thinking, Make your leg come in. I know, but yeah. someone would come and say, hey, leg makeup. I'm thinking, what are you doing? Trying to offend me? What are you doing? What, what are you doing here? I don't know what the hell you're talking about. <laughs> By the time I get my shit together and, and figure it out and do all the bullshit logistics to get it into a store, it's not leg makeup anymore. It's toe makeup now or, yeah. or arm makeup or somebody <laughs> else's. So this is like we said, I guess this is where potentially where your your brand now on behalf of an influencer is pushing is someone selling. I mean, what I'm what I'm wondering is like what happens to the retailer in a few years? Because at that point, if I like it and I really want it and I'm seeing it now, where do you think I'm gonna go and do this? Like I'm doing the deal, right? But but Kenny, I think I think there's so to me, I think there's two things there. One is, I think the, because the model you have is like the one that you're talking about is a bricks and mortar. So in a bricks and mortar, I there's a different play. Like I think, 100%. I think like if you're a bricks and mortar business that has online, now you're unlocking the piece that every you're trying retailer, to. Well, every but you're retailer, still a bricks and mortar retailer. like every retailer that's a bricks and mortar business has like between 15 and 18% of their stuff is online, right? Right. And they desperately want that to be like right. 45. So, right. and I think David's got the piece that helps you get a chunk of the way there because now you're going, I don't need to behave like a regular bricks and mortar business. I don't right. need to move a thousand pallets of anything. This week it's leg and right. maybe I move a pallet of that stuff, of, you know, cool. I can do that, right? Like I can make this deal, I can make it now and I can get this done. I do think that the analytics is where you start to make bigger bets so you can say, all right, so you know what? Leg comes back every year because I don't know, it's April and if you live in Canada, you're a bit pasty, but you don't wanna look like you're pasty because you didn't have money to go away to a beach. So we're gonna sell a pallet of leg makeup every april because nobody wants to look pasty right. in april until the sun comes into may right maybe i just made up a trend i, get, I don't know who but, knows but you know what i mean like but now all of a sudden to a retailer there's there's a there's an online play that gets me a short burst that helps me gain share but then the long-term data tells me here's how i crush it right like here's how i market the shit out of it so next april maybe i sell three pallets four pallets five pallets of this because I figured out what everyone's after with the, do you I know, guess like it, I don't I know totally if I'm, agree with you. I guess I'm, my point I'm, is, I, I haven't let more David talk yet, but, <laughs> but I think but that's, that's what, what I'm think thinking. Is. I think yeah. you put more faith in the retailer than I'm going to put in the retailer because the online business just didn't happen during COVID. Like it seems to people think it's all of a sudden it was COVID, you know, retailers like retail, retail figure, oh, there's an online play. It was gifted to them. Someone from above yeah, but, or wherever but, threw this bug but on the, the truth planet is, and away we is go. There, there's uh, the momentum's there now, right? Like right. online isn't but going away. But can they away. actually do it though now? Can they capitalize on it? I don't know. Because I'm not convinced well, the I retailer did anything to, except right? show up. I, I don't think there was a thought. Yeah. 
So guys, I, I told you we we're going to have a fun conversation. Did you think we were going to be talking about <laughs> league makeup? <laughs> we don't tell league makeup still. We don't oh, know what we, love it it. we love, love it. it. We love it. We love it. We love it. This is fantastic. Like, I've got tattoos, so I'm thinking leg makeup, maybe such like a tattoo. I don't know. So, uh, so I have a, I have a different uh, perspective, which is I yeah. think I I think stores are going to get smaller. I think what's going to happen is that when you go to the mall and you have these mega mega stores um, with all of that, all, all those inventory problems, I think what's going to happen is you're going to have more experiential stores. Right. You, right. you go in to smell the thing, touch the thing, feel yeah. the thing, try it on, yeah. and then you're going to hit a button. On on a, a yeah, digital go home um, yeah. POS, right. and it'll be at your house tomorrow, guaranteed or same day in certain mm -hmm. circumstances, um, and that changes everything um, when they start thinking that way um, because it means you can put stores in every mall. You can have your brand in every single mall mm -hmm. um, because you've got a, a much smaller footprint, and you're thinking experientially and making it really fun and cool, and you know. I think that's the cool part, though. I guess that's why I have little faith in traditional retail of really yeah. grasping this. Uh, if if it's not going to be, um, you know, horseshoe luck that they, they really had in the last couple of years, which was COVID. I mean, not that that's lucky for a lot of people, obviously, but they they took a benefit that was just handed to them. It's not that they went out and did anything creative. It's not that anybody was thinking in the basement of how to do this. It just got it landed on their lap. Once this slows down, I'm not convinced that they have the ability to rethink this and get it going where you had like a store, like an Apple or whoever it was, where you went in, there wasn't, there wasn't a ton of stuff you could buy. It's not, yeah. the store's not packed. Like no. half the stuff, I, you know what it is, is they'll show me, I get to play with, I touch it. Yeah. You can order be at the house tomorrow. And I leave thinking, fuck, that's pretty good. I get it tomorrow where I'm thinking, right. well, why am I excited? Like in the old days, I was supposed to be able to buy it like right it's now, in my hand, yeah. but that's okay. Yeah. I had, I could, I, at least I know now what it's going to do. Like I'm stoked, right? This thing's going to kill it. I'm but, okay but waiting. I, I think, so here's, here's where like, you know, David said earlier that brands and influencers are, are going to, you know, kind of swap places. Yeah. And, but I also think that brands and retailers are going to do some swaps. Like it's already happening, right? So if you look at uh, Nike in the marketplace, right? Yeah. Nike, Nike is on a, a record pace. Like they've dropped something like 50 or 60 retailers in North America alone, right? In the last two years, because they've right. said, why am I selling to, you know, uh, designer shoe warehouse or shoe factory. These guys don't do anything for don't me. Do anything for my, me. My 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 Air Zoom, my Air Pegasus goes in there. Nobody knows anything about these things, right? They're just on the shelf. So I can do that, and I can deliver a better value mm -hmm. with people going to my website than they can coming to the store. And so they've started to drop all these guys, right? right? These guys are all because they haven't done anything, but that also forces retail to be more experiential, right? Because the guys that want to stay Foot Locker, right? Has transformed their business because they are petrified of losing that portion. They they need to be experiential in order to keep these, right? But there's no other reason, so, folks. I could just go to the brand and yeah. just buy. I don't need to retail. But, but, but I think that's going to be part of this too, is now, you know, the evolution of the business starts to make this more like i i think this is where the retailers who matter are going to be able to like do something with this I oh yeah. This is, yeah this is this is nuclear yeah. bomb kind of stuff if you no, did totally it, right the reason is is because data is everything yeah and, yeah and that's it, it once you've tasted the data when you when you and what i mean yeah i don't mean data as in just like a bunch of numbers i'm talking about you you want you have a direct relationship with that customer yeah you mean that they bought these shoes four times um, you know, you're, you're going to have some special event at a place near there. You want to make them a bit of a VIP because they now mm -hmm. matter to you. You didn't have that with before. No. That was you didn't know anyone that was doing no. anything. We mm -hmm. used to have that problem actually back in the video game industry. I used to make cartridge-based games, and it's the scariest thing ever. We'd make the game and we'd ship it, and and there's no communication with the gamers <laughs> ever because there was no internet. So yeah. there was no not even a feedback loop. I don't even know yeah. what level they got to. I don't know if they ever completed the game. I know nothing. And that's terrible. Um, and once once the internet came along and we could start actually watching and saying, oh my goodness, you know, this level's too hard. That's, and then they start patching the games and making them work better for everybody. Um, it's like that with retail. 
Um, I think once when COVID hit, a lot of products were actually returned. So it was a new, it was, it was, they, I mean, if you're, if you um, had a warehouse at the time, oh. it was not good because all the retailers were just sending your stuff back to you saying, you know, this is, we're not going to be selling it. And, and you're left with all of, you know, just an absolute nightmare. Mm -hmm, right. um, and so this idea of selling online directly to the consumer, not only gives you a much better margin, you know, obviously deal um you you get the customers right and so that's one other thing that, that we allow in our platform is is um is that when a brand sells a product that they can actually transmit the order over to the supplier and and include the customer and um and that's a a, a stunning relationship growth situation so imagine you're the helmet company and and customers are just appearing out of nowhere into your customer database at a customer acquisition cost of zero because they're just being added. Yeah, That's awesome. Yeah. It's it's like it's like how many of those would you like? And and the answer is not every brand will allow will allow that. Um, mm -hmm. but, but when brands are really really close and they don't feel they're competing, right? The raw men are complementing each other, right? Yeah, we're yeah. complementing each other. Then yeah. then they then they actually permit yeah. that. And so I think that's kind of a, a fascinating piece of it. But there's also business expansion. There's there's a, a company called Blendjet that makes this handheld blender, okay. um, very popular with influencers. And what it is is, you know, when you blend something and you pour it in a glass, then it starts to settle and you end up drinking the settled version. Mm -hmm, right. Um, with a portable blender, you you give it a zap just before you drink and it's always blended, which is actually a very cool upgrade to to, to that sort of space. But um, Blendjet didn't have refrigerated warehousing, so couldn't sell what goes in the blender. So you have all these ingredients, you know, oat milks and things like that that they want to sell. Um, and so what was kind of fun is is they brought a whole bunch of brands into our platform, including Oatly, um, which was very nice of them. Mm -hmm. As a result, we ended up with um, with a, a, a whole bunch of brands that could sell the things that go in a blender. And then Blendjet made the, the killer move, which is something that I think is, is also kind of fascinating for online commerce, is um, always ask yourself the question, are they ever going to need to restock this? Um, because if they do, sell them that now, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you know, yeah. you're getting your, your whatever's. Would you like me to just go ahead and automatically send That's you a subscription one? base, which is kind of cool, right? Yep. I don't have to worry about it anymore. It's a big the, deal. The, big the, deal. The, the average order value goes up. We've seen people with average order values go up 80%, yeah. um, you know, just by thinking a little bit differently. And that part of that modern thinking for how to, how to interface with your customers is, um, you know, is there any way to turn this into a, a longer transaction with you than just the, than just the, mm. this current visit? But, but you see why that direct relationship to that customer matters. Imagine you're selling this protein powder and, and it's through some store and you've got no relationship to that buyer ever. Um, that's not the best. No, the, best the unfortunate thing. part is, so like, that's what I guess I was getting back to. That is sort of the reality of today. Yeah. Right? There is nothing. Yeah. There is nothing yeah. in between. How much cooler would it be as if you could get to the end user and have that talk? You never know what they get back from them. Hey, you know, have you ever thought about this flavor, uh, David? How about this stuff? Have you ever thought about adding this to it? Whatever it is, because they'll do that with you, obviously, right? Once they get to know you too, right? The relationships go both ways, right? Yeah, and probably the, the one doesn't happen thing, in stores. One other thing to think about is um, is all wow. these brands that are selling on Amazon. Um, that that's another interesting place in a, a moment in time. So Amazon is an unbelievable platform for selling on, but um, Amazon's very interested in taking over your category. Yes, they are. And um, and they create private labels. Yes, they do. Endlessly. And I I have a, a, a thing which I talk about, which I think is funny, is I found a, um, you know, in, um, you take a piece of leather and you want to put the letter A in it, you buy a little brass stamp with the letter A and you hit it with a hammer and you, and you can put letters in leather. Um, Amazon makes their own leather stamps. And I laughed when I saw this because are you kidding me? They're already making leather stamps. And so then I would say to brands, how safe do you feel? <laughs> Whatever category you're in, you know, you're in white socks. How safe do you feel knowing they're already in leather stamps? Like they are coming after you. And, Absolutely. And I think, I've got, I can give yeah. you horror stories. I know people have had yeah. containers land and it's too late because their products already now an Amazon product. But, but they're, they're already, box, they, they're they, 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 I think the part of the thing about Amazon that's amazing and terrible at the same time is 
they say they're a tech company, right? Because I always say that they're a tech company and not a retailer, but they behave like a retailer, like a the worst like kind of retailer. A certain world's largest retailer that's in multiple countries is renowned for putting apparel companies out of business, right? Like I, I probably know four or five labels, like the people that ran those labels who said this certain number one retailer in the world came to us and said, listen, we want to just license your brand because we'll be able to buy your t-shirts for cheaper than you can buy them. Trust us on this. Mm -hmm. you, you can fight with us and we'll just show you or you should just trust us and just just we'll license it. We'll, we'll cut you a little check every month and yeah. we pretty much own the band, brand, right? And you kind of go, what just happened? Like I, I had my brand like swept out from underneath me, right? So mm -hmm. I, I like I like your model because it does, it allows you to be able to do that and then control who lands on, you know, because right now, on your Amazon page, you don't control any of it, right? Like people bid for that spot, you know, um, you know, all sorts of crap lands, you know, as adjacent products, right? And not necessarily, it's not data driven, right? Like, well, it's Amazon. It's data driven by Amazon. Data driven. Because you're competing with Amazon too. Remember, they <laughs> it's, have, they well, have no, no it's an, Amazon eh? self-interest driven, right? Absolutely. It's not necessarily consumer interest driven. No. My, no. my dream for this is that we build... Um, like an organism of brands that all help each other. Imagine um, that. So imagine you were to leave Amazon and you're out there in the cold internet buying each click from Google or Facebook um, <laughs> at the top existence or yeah. you do it in with a whole bunch of people working yeah. together. Yeah. The reason is, is that will ultimately give us the ability to negotiate with shipping companies and things like that as right. a app. I think the, the the value of a network negotiating versus mm -hmm. an individual brand right. is Agree. profoundly different. But I'm also right. hoping that people help each other. In the game industry, um, I was on the board of the Game Developers Conference for 10 years. And, and we we basically, um, as you watch that, that thing grow, it was so fascinating to see how much sharing was going on. Like people would share not only what game they're working on, but what they're doing next and how they're doing it. And you're like, really? You're willing to like share that information? The answer is yes, because they're also learning from other people telling them Absolutely. stuff, inspiring them. And you've got the best of the best getting up to a microphone and sharing what they're doing. It was it was an incredible thing. That's pretty and cool. So That's awesome. I'd love to see that in e-commerce where um, I, I do get little taste of it when I go to like a marketing conference or something, someone will throw something out there, like some information of how to get access to something. And everyone's like, oh my God, that's so helpful, right? Yes, but can't we just do that at scale? Like, can we have, there's an expert in every subject, like right. someone really, really into shipping. There's someone really into product photography, yeah. you know? Can we share that information? Um, it's very common people have, inf have knowledge and they don't value their own knowledge. Right. And, I see this all the time. Like yeah. I got into, when I built my man cave, I got into woodworking and I, I'm one of these people that kind of goes obsessive when I'm into something and I'm all in, I'm flying to Iowa to learn how to make rocking chairs. And, I, and, I, and you go to a conference on woodworking and people will stand up and go, Oh, I use this, this, um, I, um, uh, you know, this varnish and, and then you go, but hold on a minute. You've been doing this for 30 years and you've come to, you've decided that after 30 years, this is the best varnish. Yeah. It, and and they play i'll never no get there value. yeah i'll never get there yeah yeah but for me i'm like well that's the one i'm going to use and that's what i'm it. using because you just told me that's yeah, awesome yeah. you I, saved I, me like you. hundreds of dollars of in varnish yeah, yeah yeah right that that's everywhere in e-commerce yeah. people have that information so even yeah. you guys when you're when you're talking um and creating these conversations there are nuggets that are constantly being generated um you know that in a way that what you're doing is a piece of that future that I want to it see. It is our hope, actually. I want to be Absolutely. Yeah. Like that. That's so, if, if it could just be untapped, the value of that, um, I mean, because when you look at um, someone's website, like I've, I've been on, um, you know, on Clubhouse, for example, sometimes someone will, will, will uh, send a link and say, have a look at my website. And we look at their website and it's like, oh my God, the product photography is terrible. And they're moments away from that being solved, right? Because, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. here's, yeah, here's, yeah. here's people you should be yeah. working with. It's yeah. going to change your life as a brand. Yeah. Just call this guy. He'll fix you. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. And yet yeah, without that information, they're taking their stuff without yeah. their iPhone and they're just moving forward with that. And it's like, oh boy, you know, this could be so easily fixed. And so, it is our hope to like, that's we, what we, we try to do. Like, that's I the whole mean, point this of the podcast, podcast, yeah, is very much about that, right? Is, is um, 
you know, the small moments, the, the things that we can share. Sometimes they're big moments like, like this conversation, I think. Yeah. Uh, but, but there are a lot, right? Like, and, and it's, it's amazing to hear, right? Like we've, we've heard people say, you know, we heard your conversation on costing, uh, you know, and then, and then we went out and did these things and yeah, it was so much easier, you know, like there are these moments that you just go, oh yeah, that's amazing. It's exactly what we're after because it's not that hard, right? But it can be if you don't know what you're looking for. So, right. Yeah. And not having people to share. Like you yeah. said, it's always with that same thing. If I don't know, I know it. You know what? I know a guy. Yeah. It's always I a standard line. I know a guy. Yeah. I used to go to the TED conference because of the ideas. Like, I yeah. just, yeah. I, I lived off ideas. I went to a marketing conference recently where the guy, there was a guy talking about Facebook groups. I've never used Facebook groups, I know nothing about it. Um, and this guy goes, I found a way to become relevant instantly in Facebook groups. Uh, and I'm like, well, well, how would you do that? And he goes, um, first of all, study what they, what, you have to pull the data and study what they're saying the most. So people keep talking. This is a group on scuba diving. Right. So he goes into a scuba diving group and he notices that everyone's talking about um, the, the thing they want the most is a vacation for scuba diving. Right. And he's like, OK, interesting. So then he drills into that. Where do they want to go? And of all the places mentioned for holidays, the number one is is uh, shark diving in Mexico. So he then calls a guy in Mexico who takes people shark diving and does a Zoom call with them. And then he and then he posts that video into the group. And suddenly he's a rock. Star. He's a rock star, man. You just connect with that. My dream is now a reality. <laughs> Right. So this, is what, this is how it works. This is what it costs. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need. They, they it's just you can imagine how potent that is as, as a bomb just to drop right yeah. into that group. And this is and suddenly you become relevant. Um, and so I love that stuff, right? These are these are just ideas, but I love ideas. And yeah. uh, and so yeah. you know, that kind of sharing when you get people to just step and go, well, here's what I did. It's like to him, it's nothing, no big deal. But to me, that's like genius, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's taking twenty years to figure it out. Hello, my name's Bob. <laughs> <laughs> right, I like scuba diving too. Whatever, who cares? It doesn't wow. matter. So um, that's, that's David funny. Perry, we're we're out of time, uh, but thank you that for awesome, coming. Man. This thank this is so amazing. Much. We're we're so, so glad that you were able to come on. Um, this is this has been really amazing. Oh, thanks for inviting yeah. me. No, that was wicked. Yeah. Man. So Thank if we have listeners much. that that are listening to yeah. you and maybe want where do they find you to learn a little bit more or have yeah. you push them? In, well, how do they find you? The, uh, the our company website is get caro, um, so get c a r r o dot com. Um, if they have a Shopify store, go ahead and install Caro um, and check it out. Um, but please email us to hello at getcaro.com and mention this podcast and we will take VIP care of you. So, so oh, just make- oh, thank you. That was nice, man. Thank you. I appreciate thank that. You. Thank, thank you, you very much. Yeah. That was yeah. so cool. Honestly, that like, yeah, Phil, it's funny. It's so fantastic. Phil's, usually it feels in Toronto and I'm in Vancouver, except today Phil's in my basement. And I'm upstairs because we were worried about reverb on the <laughs> podcast because we're in town for, he's in town for a conference. And I'm just thinking, okay, get this guy off the call. Phil, I'll meet you in the living room. Got a lot to talk about. Got lots of shit to do now. That's <laughs> uh, funny. That was awesome. I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. That was wonderful. I, I did too. I did wonderful. Too. Thank you. Thanks All so right. much, David. Wow. Well, thanks so much. I'll see you guys later. Take okay. care, buddy. That was Take great. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, that's awesome. Cool, dude. We got that's lots very, to talk cool. about after this podcast. <laughs> like, seriously. I mean, you know, fuck. Yeah. There's a lot of cool shit. I mean, I, I, wow. You know, I knew where you were going too. I, I guess to me, all I kept, you know, all I kept hearing, because, you know, me, I'm very narrow minded and thinking, I kept You're hearing, narrow minded. I'm thinking, oh my God, if I'm a retailer, I'm shitting my pants right now. If I don't get my shit together and really start thinking about what I'm doing, like thinking, not just waiting for shit to happen and I just go for the ride, you're in trouble. You're because already like, you're already I, I'm there. not kidding. Like the Nike, Nike example, your Nike, your Nike example, we yeah. live in, the, in this house. We're, we live we're, on that. We're doing it now. With you. Like, like, you know, there are companies, DSW is scrambling now because they should be scrambling. They cannot sell Nikes anymore. You know, so Wait, what are you going to do? Buy Nikes, from there, Nikes is going to be what? A 35, 40 share of your business. If, if not it's more, the sne- if it's in the sneaker side, what more? else are you buying? Absolutely. Like, so, so now you're, you're 
you're into discount brands like Puma. Yeah, or you're buying the Nike discount six times after yeah. the last you Nike know? distributor who can't do anything with it gets it. Well, well right all the and in, in that category, like I'm like you, like in certain categories, I wait for cool shit. Like yeah. I, you know, for me, I love okay, not we're gonna plug in Nike. I fucking love Nike. I think yeah. Nike makes wicked product. Uh, I think they're I do. I think they got I like cool their Converse. Shit. I like Converse. Oh, I'm I've a always cons loved guy. It. Come on, seriously. I'm a cons guy, but because that's a yeah. little kid. I've been wearing it. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I like their stuff. And yeah. I like the quality of their stuff. I like, I like, I like the feel of, I like how it makes me feel. Like, I think Nike makes me feel better. It might even make me a little bit better. I don't know for sure, but it might. Well, no, they actually have a shoe that makes you run faster. See? They actually do. So, yeah. I think they do. They do. And if they don't, they still do. But it shows you, though, like, if you connect really with a brand, yeah. at the end of the day, where would you buy Nike? I buy Nike at Nike. Well, and it comes to my house, right? Like, Absolutely. so I know what size I am. So I like, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not a huge, uh, I buy them for the kids for sure. I, I myself, I don't wear Nikes like for sports and stuff, but I know what my size is. I know yeah. exactly what my size is. I know what cons I could, I could buy cons with my oh, I eyes buy Converse closed. With I don't have to, I don't have to look. I know yeah, exactly. With my I, eyes closed. I know 100%. exactly what it is and I'd buy them right yeah. on the spot. Right. Like, yeah. you know, so you kind of like, yeah. you know, and so you kind of go, why why if like a footlocker i might go because he might be able to tell me something about um like a limited edition or you know a pair of you know air zooms that i didn't know yeah, something there's 15 about guys it. online that can tell me that yeah 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 but but at least at footlocker they could tell me that but if i'm going to dsw they can't oh, tell they me can't anything tell me. more about First it of, you right? can't find like, anybody you know, and then they never know whether it was this year or last year's model uh, or any so of those. You models, know as well as I do. So. Those are two or three year old models. Yeah, 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 so at yeah. the end of the day, yeah. how current are they? They're not. Yeah. And again, that's fine. I mean, their yeah. their model was built on that. It's yeah, 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 yeah. close out second yeah. hands. But you start losing a brand like that, you've yeah. lost me. You you've you're in trouble. Sorry. I I, I you're in trouble. limit interest yeah. then, right? Yeah. What am I gonna do? Yeah. Right? Wow. Anyway, I'm really glad we had David on. I'm super happy we had him on. Uh, I didn't know how the hell that was going to go because yeah. I didn't know what he did. But wow. What a yeah, like, I guy. mean, it is something Kenny and I talked about, right? Because uh, like in, in the audience, if, if you've got an opinion on this, we have largely kept service provider types out because we don't like the salesy portion of what they bring normally. Um, and so we, we just feel like with the brand, with the audience that we have, we we bring success stories and people who like bring a lot of value so we're conscious to stay away from kind of pitchy like a sales pitch you don't i, yeah, I don't want you guys to have like pitchy buying platforms something. right so right. but but david runs something that i think brings a lot of value <laughs> and is quite interesting so um anyway if if you're a listener and, and you have an opinion like head to the website ping us yeah let us um, know let us know i really yeah. enjoyed that one yeah that's i really, really enjoyed awesome. that one yeah it's really awesome wow that was fun okay i'll awesome. meet you in the living room okay thanks for listening <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye, guys. Ciao.